Today I'm really going to talk about um, what some of the projects I've worked on in the community and uh, some of the things that are going on in the RepRap side of things as a maker really. So um, to me it's, it's, uh, it's really important that I get across a little bit of a message of how the lower end, sometimes seen, but very vibrant community that is RepRap um, comes across to you. So, I should do my very best, and uh, please feel free to tweet me whether I'm doing good or bad. I can take it, it's fine. Um, and uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so a little bit about me. I'm, I've been in the electronics industry for over 20 years, and uh, I started my career, uh, and I did 15 years working as an electronics engineer. So this doesn't come naturally, because I'm an engineer um, talking to you, but. Uh, all that time, I spent a lot of time developing products for all sorts of industries, from consumer products to medical and all types of things, working with really interesting clients, uh, but actually only really had involvement with 3D printing and rapid prototyping and design probably around 1999 when I was lucky enough to work um, uh, on a project for Dyson, which was really good. And uh, they're a very big company. They had about 350 odd engineers at the time, and they uh, used our very small company with only about 30 engineers uh, to help them out with their washing machine. Um, now, that was really great. They're a very secretive company, so it was really good to go in there and see the technology they had. And um, for me, it was wonderful because they needed to keep everything in house. They got lots of patents, lots of protection, lots of secret things. And um, uh, the very first time I saw really saw rapid prototyping or 3D printing in those days, uh, just going in 3D printing, was with Dyson. And so that was really amazing because before then, we had designed electronics in, in the company I worked for and with really just 2D plans. So all we got was 2D views. We designed our electronics to fit into boxes and really that was it. So with Dyson, there was a whole another way of working where we got prototypes and um, uh, uh, concepts to fit our electronics into and that really opened up uh, my mind to, to 3D printing. After that, a lot more of the customers that we dealt with started using 3D printing, especially for consumer appliances, consumer electronics. So rapid prototyping um, uh, became sort of more and more of my professional life. Um, it's in the electronics industry, I still, even to this day, cannot really give you that many examples of where uh, rapid prototyping or 3D printing is used in the electronics industry for manufacturing. It still is used for rapid prototyping, testing out molds before they go to be uh, fully tooled and manufactured. Okay, so in 2010, after doing a little bit of research on uh, the RepRap project, I, I launched my blog, uh, which was richrap.blogspot.com. Um, and I put up my early attempts to build a 3D printer, which were pretty awful, really, but they got going. And uh, I was really proud to have first month uh, about 150 views on my blog. Whoa, great. Um, the next month after that, there was 1,000. And then it got up and up. And really, over the years, the, the amount of uh, work I put into my blog um, is shown in the visitor views and page views over the years. So, now, my blog's running at around 85,000 page views a month and increasing by about 10,000 a month. Um, so it's, it's really quite popular and really shows the interest in 3D printing. Okay, so this is a lot about me, but you need to know my background a little bit. Um, I, I'm driven by kids and education. So for me, all of the work I do with 3D printing is thinking about how the future kids and um, uh, our generation, our future generations will use 3D printing uh, in their daily lives. So for me, um, it's really important that uh, I get the most out of that. I've got two young children, eight and five now, and uh, when I first started, my, my oldest was only five. Um, so I've, I've, they've grown up with 3D printing. They, that's all they know in, in my, my uh, my existence, I wouldn't be able to tell them a great deal about electronics and engineering because they're quite small, but they can see 3D printing, they can see what it can do, and they actually use it in my house. They know how to use my 3D printers. So the bit at the bottom um, about sewing machines, a little bit random, but this is my perspective on uh, my, my point of view for 3D printing state of play at the moment. So 
during my life, uh, growing up, we had two sewing machines in my house. My mum used one for fixing everything. It was make, do and mend, doing everything possible. Uh, and again, that was from the 1950s, the, the, the thought process of, of using these machines in our houses to uh, fix and repair and do things. My dad had one as well, but for kite uh, making. So he wouldn't go anywhere near fabric, wouldn't be interested in doing that, but he used to make kites out in the garage. And he customized this machine to do large kites and all that sort of thing. So I always think about 3D printing of when it will be useful to the consumer, when it will be useful to more people, a bit like a sewing machine. It's not a great analogy, but it's my point of reference, and I grew up sort of seeing these things being used actively in the home. And I personally don't believe 3D printing as it stands today is, is a very good um, tool for consumers. I don't believe they're going to be in everyone's house anytime soon. I don't see why you need them. And I know it sounds a bit negative and you'll see the, some of the things that I've done, but they're not a sewing machine. They're not a microwave. They're not something you really, really need. So I'm still waiting to see what the killer applications are, as we all are. But for me, it's still quite a long, long way off. Okay, so what drove me to 3D printing and getting into it in my, my um, hobby time uh, was the RepRap project started by Adrian Boyer in 2004, which is quite surprising because that's 10 years old next year. And again, some people think RepRap's only been going for a few years, but it took a long time to actually get going. Um, again, another one of the things it's built on expired patents. Now, this is often seen as a bad thing, something that has been abused by uh, the, the open source community, but actually it all needed to be done from scratch. There was no easy methods just because the patents had expired. RepRap still had to do everything from scratch. There, there was no easy route. So hopefully you know a little bit about RepRap already. If you don't, come and see to us afterwards. Come and see uh, us afterwards. But it, it is actually a self-replicating machine. It's not just a 3D printer. We're not, we're not just making 3D printers here. It's, it's about the printer printing itself and developing and evolving. It's described as accessible because it's supposed to be made out of twigs and string. It's not supposed to be made out of CNC machined materials. It's supposed to be able to be built anywhere in the world from simple, simple materials and simple tools. So it can often look quite, uh, quite poor in its, in its uh, um, uh, presence. Um, Adrian has described it as well as, as virus-like growth, and, and this gripped me from day one, really. The, the printer compels you to replicate it, and you end up with a lot of printers in your house if you're a RepRap developer uh, and, a, and a user. Um, when I say I'm a maker, I'm a maker of printers and technology. I don't actually use 3D printers for a great deal else. I make 3D printers with 3D printers. So it is an ad hocracy. The, the RepRap project. It's totally random. People do what they want. There's no real deep control about uh, who's doing what and, uh, and what's developed at any time. It uses natural selection as a way of shedding the bad ideas or the not so good ideas and people pick up the ones that are good. And uh, the, 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 one of the things that really sort of changed the Rep Rap project and got it all moving was this little pair of shoes. That was about 2008, and that's when I first heard about it. It was in the press. And um, the Rep Rap project, uh, again, tries to keep down to earth. It doesn't hype things up. So Adrian posted this on a blog saying, I've just produced these little shoes. Um, it would be great. I remember how many times I had to buy shoes for my kids as they were growing up. And it wasn't actually Rep Rap that went further than that. They just stated that this was a thing that I could now do with the printer that we've just developed in the University of Bath. It was the comments underneath that people were saying, oh, wouldn't it be good if you could recycle those shoes? You could crunch them up and then rebuild them. And it was all the comments afterwards that actually led to some of the press picking up on that and saying, wow, this is going to be great. And it led to a little bit of hype, but it got the, got the word out and got everything going. So. That was, that was how I actually sort of first heard about it, but I, I, I was too busy in my life to do anything about it then, so I just followed it along. Um, another thing that RepRap is sort of often accused of is not making it easy for people. It's, it's got a bit of a, a, a dilemma there because it's supposed to be making it accessible, but I don't want to sound, um, uh, I don't want to take this the wrong way, but it's, it's a project that you really have to get involved in, and you have to sort of think in engineering ways. Um, it's not a product that you just use. So the whole project is about 
understanding the technology, being able to use it and fix it when it goes wrong, because it does go wrong. So a lot of people say, oh, can't you make it easier? It's supposed to be making it easier. I thought you guys were doing this for accessibility. It's not really the point. And as engineers, the last thing we want to do is write a manual or make it easy or anything like that. So it's quite a difficult thing sometimes to make it easy for people that, that are uh, not used to getting their hands dirty with electronics and, and uh, um, mechanics and all that sort of thing. It also has a bit of an image problem uh, because it is so random, it is so widespread, and they do look a bit ugly, some of these machines. They're not, they're not the loveliest uh, things in the world. Um, and also, it is sort of targeted to consumers, but it's not. As I said before, it's really aimed at developing and um, sort of eking out new ideas that can spread out into commercial enterprises, as we've seen with a lot of uh, um, projects that have sprung out of the RepRap. So that brings me on to the, would we, we be here without RepRap? So it's a little bit uh, um, uh, presumptuous to say that RepRap's had a massive impact, but it really has. Um, the, the technology languished for 30 years, being used in industry, but I firmly believe that without the RepRap project and all the things that it brought, um, we wouldn't really be in this sort of level of, of excitement and, and uh, industry acceptance um, without, without this, this, uh, this, this um, technology. MakerBot certainly wouldn't be here, and they wouldn't have got half a billion dollars or so for selling uh, their technology um, because it, the RepRap um, started uh, and gave them a push into that that uh, that first MakerBot um, prod, uh, product that came that they came out with. Um, sort of went their own own ways last year or so. But uh, okay, so I want to move on to something else uh, that's quite important to me, and it should be important to everyone really, and that's license terms. RepRap again, and a lot of these projects use open source. They use uh, technology that is freely distributable, but they have license terms, and the license terms are really, really important. We lost, uh, I wouldn't say we lost, but Asher Namias uh, had a bit of a falling out with some companies this year and pulled all of his uh, um, uh, objects off of Thingiverse, uh, mainly because he was not getting credited for these being used as commercial, um, uh, uh, these, these being used in a commercial way, it wasn't getting any credit for them. And that's really, really sad because most things out there have a commercial license. It's, it's our jobs to understand what that means, what you can do with them, and make sure you attribute the right uh, um, information when you do that. Okay, so I made it my mission this year to try and widen out my, my view of 3D printing, see where it was going to go, I went to a lot of different shows and festivals that are not the maker fairs and shows like this because I wanted to see how widespread the, the 3D printing was getting it, it out, outside of our little industry or big industry. Um, some of the festivals I went to were really interesting. Uh, I found out a lot about glass castings with ceramic shells. That's, uh, that was one of the really innovative festivals down in Devon uh, and they were uh, there was a lot of people there doing some really clever work with 3D printing, uh, with the jewellery. Uh, we've got Electra Bloom down the end there that have been doing this for quite some time. But there was other people using 3D printing directly for jewellery and, and for glass casting. Um, I get uh, also people uh, contacting me quite a lot. And one of the things is art, the artwork, using 3D printing. There was a one guy, again, showing at, at the show using 3D printing to have a 3D effect on a canvas and using silicon and oils to actually bring that out. Really interesting effects, but it was using 3D printed parts stuck onto the canvas and then manipulated afterwards to give all sorts of really nice effects. So it's getting out there, it's getting used in creative industries and that sort of thing. Um, I'm going to skip the weather vanes thing. You can ask me about it later, but I'm running a bit low on time. Okay, so for me, that 2014 is, is about a little bit to shake down to see whether or not we'll have something aimed at the consumer. You can probably see from that picture that I'm not a fan of multifunction devices. I think they're a bit of a pig. And just recently, in the last uh, couple of months, we've seen a lot of products, a lot of 3D printers come out with scanners in them uh, and all sorts of different things fitted in to do an all-in-one to do faxing and scanning and 3D objects and all that sort of thing. And I think that's a really bad move. I think that's going to further um, uh, bring up the hype of what might be possible, but actually the realities are going to be pretty poor, pretty bad. So 
I'm looking more forward to dedicated 3D printers that have more specific focus on different applications. Um, I mean, Todd was mentioning that there was sort of direct uh, medical uh, 3D printers and, and, and uh, 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 metal 3D printers. And I think even in the lower end, we're going to start seeing dedicated 3D printers just for single purposes and not this all-in-one, it can do everything, and you only need to buy this once, a few thousand dollars, and you've got everything you need, including a scanner and a fax machine and everything else. So for me, it's going to be really interesting in the next, next 12 months to see uh, what what, what the really low-end 3D printers, there's a lot of 3D printers that are coming out, $350 um, that have been working on Indiegogos and Kickstarter campaigns for this last year, uh, and see whether people really think they're any good, because I honestly don't think they will be. Okay, so I'll, I'll go over some of the projects I've done. Uh, my, my first uh, entry into um, 3D printing at home was with uh, layer selective color printing. Now, this was Quite, this was about three years ago, so it was before people were doing a lot of color stuff. Um, and this was a simple process of joining filament together in a, in a specific uh, length that was calculated by the, the model to work to layer up and produce pseudo 3D, uh, uh, 3D printed color uh, models. I put this on my blog and it got a lot of interest and it was really, I'm sort of now known for the color work I do in 3D printing. Um, my first 3D printer was literally held together with bits of wood and all sorts of things, but it did manage to produce quite some interesting things that, that gave way to other technologies and people using uh, color, uh, follow-on methods of color, color uh, switching. So it's not the world's first uh, uh, um, color 3D printer or anything like that, but it can do very simple things that look quite nice. And it's a very easy technology for anyone at home to do. All of my projects I do on my blog are aimed at people doing them themselves. They're not, they don't use high levels of technology. They, I, don't, I don't try to use um, uh, CNC machines or anything like that. The most I've got is a drill press. Um, so all of my things that I, that I make for extruders and other parts for 3D printers are quite accessible for people at home to do. And also try and do it in a way that makes people feel that they can have a go and do it themselves. So again, I'm not interested in taking the technology out that further and making it commercial and making it and trying to make people feel that they can do it themselves as part of the RepRap project. So for me, the magic moment was with this little uh, um, device, this little uh, uh, model here. And uh, I'm saying I've got uh, um, two young children. We, uh, uh, I was sat with my, with my uh, eldest child, she was only five at the time, watching Ben and Holly's Little Kingdom. And it's a fantastic program if you've never watched it, it's on Channel 5. And um, uh, we have these magic moments, sitting down, looking at, uh, uh, watching the TV together, and my little girl said, Daddy, can you make me one of those Holly wands? And this is a wand that Holly, uh, she's a little fairy, moves around, it's got a little face on it, and I sort of thought about it for a few seconds and said, oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and she said, okay, go on then. So I had to actually get the laptop, and we sat down, and we paused Sky and watched Ben and Holly's Little Kingdom for a little bit longer while I actually specced up the model in SketchUp. And it took a little while. To her exact specifications, I had the client next to me. So, you know, she was, she was detailing all these things that she wanted. And she said, well, I've got a, I want it to, um, I want it to uh, sparkle. I want it to be colorful. I want it to rattle. And um, uh, that should be okay, shouldn't it? And I think the point of this is that that was the moment I got the whole, whole thing about 3D printing, that it was customizable, it was designed for someone's specific purpose, and it was something special. Um, she also gave me some amazing ideas of what to do. So I figured out that if you put glitter on, on your 3D print as it was printing, it would embed inside all the plastic it was molding, and you'd have a sparkly, um, uh, glittery object. That was very easy to do, it didn't take... Uh, uh, very long. I'm glad I did it in the garage because I forgot to uh, turn the fan off and the glitter went absolutely bloody everywhere. But <laughs> that, was another, <laughs> that was another thing. Um, some of them glow in the dark um, and I dropped hammer beads, the little beads that you get for, for making things, into the uh, uh, object as it was printing before it finished off the final layers. That made it rattle. So my, my daughter was absolutely thoroughly pleased with this. The, me the next problem was she took them to school. Oh, okay, so... <laughs> Then she goes in and says, my daddy's got a toy printer in the garage, which is a difficult one to come from. And this was three years ago, remember? So this, this was a, 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 an interesting conversation to have with people at the school about what it means. But it did start to spark off all sorts of conversations. 
Um, another one I did for a friend, very quickly, I'm trying to move on a bit, uh, practical 3D printing was a friend came along and he said, I've got a new underwater camera, I've got an optical lead that goes to my slave flash, and it now doesn't fix, I've got a new camera body, uh, can you help me out? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So it's an optical lead, so it's only got an optic fiber. We chopped the end off, and I, in SketchUp, in 10 minutes, I made up a small 3D printed uh, uh, adapter that could push onto the front of there, and that saved them about $120 from buying a new lead. So again, really simple, really easy to do. My paste extruder was another one of the projects I, re I pushed up on my blog. And again, this was driven by my, by my children. I happened to have a, a 3D printer sat on, the, um, sat on the kitchen table, as you do when you've got a very understanding wife. Um, uh, one February time, just after Christmas, I was building it up. And my kids were already forgot Christmas, but they were thinking about Easter. And they said to me, can you make some 3D printed Easter eggs? I said, yeah, I suppose so. And about three weeks later, I had developed a way of making an extruder that used only mechanical, um, uh, a mechanical uh, system, whereas all of the extruders that were out there uh, for doing paste used uh, jets of air and compressors and all that sort of thing. It's very messy. So this looks like your normal extruder you put on a 3D printer, normal everyday home 3D printer. And it, it looks the same. It does the, the same amount of uh, um, steps. Uh, and you can actually then use it for paste and materials. So I've lost my uh, feed there. Um, I ended up doing uh, quite a bit with this and uh, putting it out to the community and people used it for all sorts of things. I did uh, printing of corn chips and actually baked them, 3D printing of chocolates, ceramics that you can actually then fire up. Um, and one of the other things, uh, uh, precious metal clays, that's another thing as well. And when I put it out there, one of the really interesting feedbacks I got from a company in the States was they were an electronics company. And this is one example where I can give you that. 3D printing was being used for manufacturing. What they did is they had a, a, pr a 3D printer set up and they were printing out small little boxes for electronics. It was in the, um, I think it was in the medical industry, it might have been the, the military, but uh, what they were doing, they were using a 3D printer and printing out a whole load of these, these little boxes with one extruder that was thermoplastic. And they would, when it would finish, it would beep, keep the bed hot so it would keep all the things stuck down. And they would pop in the little electronics boards. And then they would use my uh, paste extruder with, with resin um, uh, encapsulated in, into the thing to pour into each one of these boxes and seal them off in an encapsulated way. So that was all done in a single process. And as the bed cooled down, it helped cure the resin. And they were really grateful. They were really thankful that I put this up there because it solved all their problems. And it could get exactly the right amount of resin and lay it down and all that sort of thing. So that's the only real example. I can give you of somewhere that, that is being used for full manufacturing. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots more. Um, I just want to quickly mention Unfold here because they were a big inspiration to me while I was developing uh, the paste extruder. They use a system with a compressor, compressor and a syringe and auger screw, but they're doing some really amazing work. So ha have a little look about Unfold if you, if you want to look for really amazing uh, and interesting uh, objects. The next one I did, I, came, I revisited uh, color mixing and blending. This was a three-way mixer that was blending different colors. And um, uh, the University of Bath had done quite a, little, quite a lot of work on this uh, before or well, during the same time I was doing some development. And they found it was really quite difficult to mix up colors. They, you'd feed in cyan, magenta, yellows and try and get a red. And, uh, and, and unless you had an active way of stirring the, the, the um, uh, the mixture, which is pl melted plastic, you wouldn't actually get a very good, a very good blend of, of colour. Um, I was actually not that interested in doing full mixing because I can put whatever colour I like into my printer and I can get it out and I can follow and do things to, to uh, get the colours I want. But I was really interested in just leaving it without blending and, and it comes out as a sort of a toothpaste effect. So you can do some really interesting effects with mixing colours in and not actually, not actually blending them together but doing them as a, as a sort of a toothpaste. My little frog on there was quite famous, and it got, got quite a bit of press uh, uh, over, the, over the course of about uh, six months or so. So that was quite an interesting area for me. Um, the next bit that's really, that was really important to me, again with my children, was last Christmas, and it was this advent calendar by Peter uh, Lepic. Um, this really encapsulated everything I love about 3D printing, and I can't wait to do it again. And my kids have already said, as soon as they saw the advent calendars in the shops, they've said, wow, can, Dad, can we do this again? I'll explain what it was. Okay, so Peter put on Thingiverse that he was gonna do an advent calendar every day during advent, 
uh, and he would produce a new little box and a new object to go into them. He had done the first few and he asked for suggestions about what people would like and uh, all sorts of different things came out. Uh, and as he put them up, he put them up every day. So people were actively taking these in the morning, slicing them and then printing them. And for me, it was just absolutely magic. The whole run up to Christmas was wonderful. We, we ended up printing these just for bedtime. So my children, I came home from work, my children could see these being printed and they could build them up into an advent calendar. And it really was the most magical uh, build up to Christmas. And we printed up the star on Christmas day in the morning and they were really happy. It stands about this tall, it's quite a large, uh, large um, object in the end. But that really represents to me the, 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 the immediacy of someone doing something and then being able to send it all around the world and someone enjoying that. If we could only get a way of making some money out of that, maybe that would be a really good way of getting more people involved in the consumer side. Um, we've done a, a lot of tiny printing just to show the resolution of things. I won't go too much in that because I'm running a bit out of time. Um, the next thing for me was printing with nylons, and I've done this this year. Uh, a lot of new nylons came out. This is Tolman 3D. They've produced some really good nylons for the 3D printing industry. I really wanted to get more into the colour side and doing the, the dyeing of nylons. So using normal fabric dyes to dye the nylons in a sort of a tie-dye fashion ends up with a, a reel of, of really interesting coloured uh, material that you can use in 3D printing. And you end up with lovely things like this. Um, again, the, that's just fed through the machine and producing really interesting, some of those parts are quite large, produced on a Rostock printer, which is a big delta printer. Uh, but that, that again, caught, caught people's imagination about what's possible to do. And these are really strong parts. Nylon is really good uh, uh, material for home 3D printing. Again, just wanted to touch on the, on the business side. Um, pretty small things, Katie Huckram. She's uh, been a really, really uh, strong member of the community, putting up her designs on Thingiverse and um, doing a lot of work uh, on um, uh, getting, getting sort of designs out there. She, she, she works um, uh, for the uh, theatre industry and in a part time, uh, so at home she spends time making dolls furniture and she's actually got a full business now, pretty small things that she sells, um, uh, 3, 3D printed dolls furniture. She started off with MakerBots and now she's using professional level uh, printers that print in acrylics and all that sort of thing. Toys, puzzles and games, I'll skip over that, I'm really running out of time. Um, okay, so I get a lot of feedback, a lot of feedback from people and they, they ask me a lot of questions. And I always ask them, every single one, they ask me about whether, what printer to buy, what should I, what should I use. Uh, I always ask them the question of, yes, I, I understand you want one, but why do you need it? And it's really interesting some of the things that I get fed back. The first one, the question mark, is, oh, I don't need it, I just want one. And that, that's almost always the answer you get, 90% of the time. The rest are in about, about the right order of the, the level of feedback I get from people in the industry. If they just want them. Uh, and it's chocolate, chocolate printing, huge, absolutely massive. Everyone wants to do various things with food, chocolate, and they think about cakes and all sorts of sugar craft. It's huge. I answer so many questions about my chocolate extruder and what the possibilities are for chocolate printing. It really is huge. Yeah, I, I can't stress it enough. I spend, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to people about food printing. It's just it's bizarre. Um, toys and games and puzzles, there's, low, there's a whole new world open to me about that. And there's all shows and fairs that are used for 3D printing. Adult things, now this is really it's quite interesting. I don't know why people talk to me about it, but they do. And there's, there's a lot of things that, that you have, a, have to have a conversation about adult things for 3D printing. Um, and after you've gone through this, is it safe, is it, you know, all that sort of thing. I can't answer a lot of these questions. Uh, you get onto the dimensions. And RepRap printers are about 200 by 200 by 200. So they can print, you know, reasonable size. I would have thought so. Um, but yeah, the feedback I've got is that, no, that's not big enough. That's not big enough at all. And it really is quite an interesting area. So. If I ever started up a 3D printing business, chocolate, adult things, I think you can combine the two if you're really clever. That's you know, serious, my, my serious tip for this. Camera mounts, GoPro adapters, all that sort of thing, really big, as, as companies making GoPro adapters out of nylon, dyeing them black, selling them for a lot of money, 3D printed. Again, manufacturing, doing that one-off special custom things. Plenty of people doing that. Model railway guys, oh, drive me nuts. And they, they, nothing's good enough for the model railway guys. There's not, there's not good enough resolution, there's not good enough quality. It's, it's just not good enough. So I have a lot of conversations with them about that. And in the end, I just go, just wait, just wait a bit. 
flights, drones, all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, really interesting technologies used. Sorry, I'm really running out of time. <laughs> um, the other conversation, I really want to get this one in, was I had a conversation with Dr. Jonathan Howard. Now, this blew me away because I asked him the question, what do you need it for? And he said, oh, well, I develop nuclear fusion reactors uh, in my spare time in my South London flat. <laughs> Absolutely bonkers, I tell you. It's really, really bizarre. Um, now, we, we had a long conversation about this, and I urge you to go and uh, search on Vimeo, Fusioneer, and go and have a look about it. It's a 20-minute documentary about this guy, Dr. Jonathan Howard. And it's all about him making a nuclear fusion reactor in his flat in London. It's just bonkers. It absolutely is bonkers. It's a really good thing. I won't spoil the surprises, but he does create le uh, verifiable levels of um, uh, energy and radiation. So I won't go any further, but just please go and look. Why I'm telling you about this is because his actual day job is he works for a company that does MRI scanning and developing technologies for people um, in the M MRI industry. And what he told me was that nylon, nylon materials are, are, are invisible to, to uh, MRI scanners. PLA and other materials are not, they show up. And, and he spends a lot of time, he was machining and getting things built uh, with, uh, with nylon. And, um, uh, he's, sp he's, sp he's spending a lot of money. I mean, these things, these things were button panels for people to press while they were under the MRI scanners. So they were um, getting feedback from you know, how people were, were reacting to questions and doing that. These things are like $4,000. They cost a load of money. They've just got a few electronics in them, and they're specialist engineers, nylons. So he got in contact with me mainly to find out how he could get more involved with nylon printing, and he now is. He's, he's done his first sets. We, I set him up with a 3D printer. Um, and he's now doing his first lot of 3D printing for nylon, work using for, for the MRI uh, scanners. I really haven't got much time, have I? I'm overrunning, so shall I, shall I run up now? <laughs> Sorry, okay. Okay, uh, RepRap's um, uh, uh, trying to get more organized. The AM, AMRI is Advanced Manufacturing Research Institute. It's a, it's a project uh, done by Dr. Jo Jonathan, uh, Jordan Miller, and he's trying to bring RepRap in a more controlled way. Come and talk to me about it afterwards. Uh, quick future, we're doing really radical designs now. We've got um, uh, a lot more Delta bots and Scara bots and various other things that are leading the future on. My own 3D printer, you can see it running down the corner there, is a little Delta bot. I designed this for my kids. My kids know how to use this. They turn it on, I put a memory card in there that says print me. I load it up with really colorful stuff and they don't know what's going to come out until it comes out. And they love it. Uh, every, every few days I put something in there, they come home and they print with it. Um, and this is the sort of things that it can print. So come and have a look. Okay, very, very quickly, sorry to overrun. Um, really important for business. New products are coming out. German rep wrapped, huge machine, can print almost a meter square, be fine for the adult industry, um, and is CE approved. The Ultimaker 2 is now CE approved as well. So for small businesses, it's gonna be really important to see these types of uh, new things. I'll leave you just to read that. And that's the Rep Rap Magazine. Thank you ever so much. <laughs>